stand here today uh, with a plant that's closing, but I'm extremely proud of the people that work in this plant here. For a year and a half, I didn't have anything. We lost our home, we lost a vehicle. I have struggled to get back to middle class again. <laughs> this is a historic project that is gonna help grow this community, give people jobs, and give a future to your kids and my kids. You sit today used to be a General Motors plant, and now there are over 1,000 employees working here. Is this a union shop? It is our desire to not be. We hope someday to get this good. There have been 11 complaints filed. Some workers claim unsafe working conditions and unfair treatment. Doing the same thing over and over again. That wears on your body and your soul. They told me that they had to be here two years, away from their family, no extra pay. I made it their house, they made it my home. We've just bonded. I'm a riser. Now the whole world is watching. Nothing in America has changed in terms of working people working hard. What changed in America was rich people deciding they wanted to rewrite the rules to take advantage of people. You never give up on the American dream. To me, that would be un-American. Good morning. <laughs> you are in the right place for the social impact entertainment revolution. If that is not what you were expecting to attend, now would be the time. <laughs> no, just kidding. I'm Rachel Myro. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to have a fabulous discussion, as you can see, focused around the recent documentary, American Factory, available on Netflix. We have with us today... Going across the, uh, the uh, stage, Harisela, Steve, Julia, and Monique. Uh, I encourage you, if you haven't already, to uh, check out all of the information in the app, the SoCap19 app, because uh, there's no need to recap that. Let's just dive right in. But first, before we start talking, I do want to ask for a show of hands, how many people here have actually seen American Factory? All right. Well, I, I guess that tells us <laughs> that that tells us where we need to start the conversation. Julia, do you want to give us a sense of, of what this documentary is actually about? Wow, that's a big question. Uh, it's, it's the elevator about, pitch. It, yeah, the elevator. I never actually had to do that. Um, so we live in Dayton, Ohio, Steve and I, who made the film. And the plant that this takes place in, which is, makes automotive glass, is about 20 minute drive from our house. Uh, that plant closed as a General Motors plant. General Motors left and left this empty shell of a huge plant during the economic crash of 08. Fast forward about seven or eight years, and we heard, wow, the plant's gonna reopen. Somebody bought it. Turns out it's a Chinese billionaire entrepreneur, Chairman Chow. And we had a chance to go in and actually follow what happened once the plan opened over a three-year period. And that's what the film is. We had access to, like, everything. Well, uh, Steve, do you want to pick that up and, and tell us a little bit about... Uh, how you guys got to the Obamas, how you got to Netflix, how you got the money to get going. Well, we, we believe that story 
is an agent for change, and that's the one reason why I think we're all here. Uh, you know, a lot of decisions in this world are made on on data, with by and on and about data, and we want to try to upend that paradigm a little bit and and talk about the individual stories or the community stories. We believe stories are and uh, sparks for empathy, and empathy leads to action. Empathy, you know, if we if we think back to the social causes that have moved people over the recent years, it's like something touches us and we, we take action and we feel like that's the power of documentary. Uh, we were making this film on our own in Ohio and we reached a point about halfway through the filming. We, we started filming in 2015 and in mid-2016 we really needed to start to find a partner to, to, to raise money but also to help bring the film into the world. And we, we got very lucky that we, we lined up and teamed up with Participant Media, where, where Hariselda... We got lucky, too. Uh, <laughs> and Participant is a company we've known about for years. We've all seen their films, whether it's you know, Spotlight, the, uh, the uh, Best Picture winner, or Roma from last year, or their great documentaries like Inconvenient Truth RBG. or RBG from, from, from last year. Participants' uh, mission is to, you know, make movies that matter, that are entertaining, but have social impact. And when they said, we, we love your, your idea, we love what you're doing, we, we just felt a lot of alignment in terms of mission. Uh, and let me just say, participant, they really mean that, the word participant. They want audiences to take the films, whatever it is, and make social change in the world. And they're serious about it, and they know how to do it. Uh, another great name higher ground is the Obama's production company that they started as their legacy, uh, being young people in their 50s still. They had to think, well, gee, what are we going to do? And they decided to focus on storytelling. And they have started a production company. And we, we meaning Steve and I's film, a participant's film, is their first release, which is amazing. And they have lots of other things coming out, so look them up, Higher Ground Productions. I think we can expect a lot from the Obamas. Yeah, the, the President and First Lady came on board with Netflix uh, this past January when the film debuted at Sundance. And since then, Participant Media, Higher Ground Productions, and Netflix have all been working together with us to bring the film out into the world. Now you can see on Netflix there is a short conversation that's filmed yeah. uh, between you guys <laughs> and uh, uh, Barack and Michelle Obama, but but I'm curious, you know, what was your uh, interaction with them like? Were they giving you the creative freedom to make the film you felt you needed? Oh, to Oh, they came on board when the film was all done. Okay, yeah. They saw it at Sundance Film Festival when it was all done, and they told us, you know, sort of why they bonded with the film, but I think it really is encapsulated in the name, Higher Ground. One of the things, for those of you who saw the film, we take the higher ground, right? I mean, we try to be fair to everyone, whether it's the owner, the billionaire owner, the management, the HR people, the blue-collar Americans, the blue-collar Chinese. We try to listen to everybody because we, we felt like that was the best way for this film to make a difference in the world. And, you know, we, we live in a world where people are very divided right now. We all know that. So we felt like if we can get if we can create empathy for the owner, as well as the managers, as well as the workers, that would be a real step in the right direction and create conversations around that. When we started making the film, because we live in that town, our hearts were really with the blue collar Americans. But pretty quickly we realized that the 200 or 300 Chinese engineers and managers who had, who had left their hometown in Fuching, uh, Fuching in Fujian province in China, flown to Ohio in a small kind of modest, you know, gray little town, Dayton, Ohio, post-industrial scrappy little town. They were starting a whole new life there and we realized that it would be very important to tell their story as well. Now we are not Chinese and we don't speak Mandarin Chinese, we're not culturally competent, you know, in terms of China, but we turned to Chinese filmmakers who we teamed up with, uh, uh, about six of them, but especially Yi Chen Zhang and Mi Jie Li, who are both documentary filmmakers from China. They started coming to Ohio every week, and that's how we could try to tell the, the Chinese perspective as well as the American perspective. 
I find it interesting that both of you have used uh, some form of the word empathy in your comments. And I highly encourage those of you who haven't seen the film to go home and watch it tonight. It, it really is a very empathetic look at the challenges of trying to run a profitable uh, manufacturing enterprise uh, in America today. Haracela, can you, can you tell us a little bit about your role in promoting the film once they finished? Yeah, absolutely. And if um, anyone is around tonight, we are also hosting a screening at 7 p.m. at the in oh, the right. Southwest Building, so you'll have a chance to watch. Better it than tonight. seeing it on Netflix. Right. See it with sure. a group. Of yeah. Group sure. Don't yeah. tell Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's okay. <laughs> um, so Participant was originally set up to be a double bottom line company. We exist to tell the best stories, but we also understand that oftentimes those stories speak to massive issues out in the world. And these are, if we look at future of work, it's complicated. You hear all of the statistics, but what does it mean? So when we have a piece of content that puts a human lens on something so, so important yet frightening, we find that that type of content helps bring different people to the table, helps elevate the work that organizations and individuals all across the country are doing. So the way that we look at how can we take the content and create change is from a place of humility, of trying to listen to what is it that this issue space needs. And we found that the labor space was very fractured. Um, so a lot of the work that we started to, to do was, okay, how can we, if content can build a bridge, how do we do that? It starts from a place of creating the shared experience, of watching the film together, of, of experiencing that empathy, those human stories, the 350 million jobs that will be automated suddenly become the workers that you'd see on the factory floor and that microcosm is actually speaking to the nuances of globalization and cultural differences and um, automation. And then how do we get people who are not talking to each other to at least see each other and understand the other perspective? And we started by having separate conversations with different sectors to understand where they were individually coming from. And then we designed a national tour and a digital experience where we're creating events that are screenings, but also dinner conversations where we're nominating people from the community deliberately chosen from different sectors and saying, come to this event tomorrow. We're actually doing one in Indianapolis tomorrow night. Um, watch it, the film, and then just share a meal and a conversation with someone else. And at that table is going to be someone who you might not have thought to talk to before about this issue, but it's building a bridge. And then we're finding that through the digital site that we set up at AmericanFactoryFilm.com, we've had interest from 32 states already hosting their own screening in other countries, because these are, these are conversations people want to have, and film can be an entry point into doing that. So you're actually getting, which I think is so cool, owners and employees to talk to each other. Right. Like even people from the labor movement. Exactly. And, oh, and you know, owners to sit down and talk, which doesn't really happen very much. And, and not just that, is if you look at it, if you look at these issues of inequality and future of work from a community lens, our thinking is we also want academics in there, we want policymakers, we want f people from the faith community, and we also want students. That's one of the, the most interesting things that we've found. There is so much excitement. We've heard a number of schools are already using the film in their classrooms, so we're just trying to get it out because the appetite is there. Um, Monique, do you want to tell us how this film resonated for you from the perspective of the work you do for J.P. Morgan? Yes, um, so the work that we do within global philanthropy is really focused on kind of the global context of jobs and skills. And the future of work frame is ubiquitous, right? In every market that we're invested in, that's really kind of the, the loudest theme that comes out. Um, and given the scale of it, it's very easy to lose the face 
of the challenge, right? It's very easy to kind of get caught up in the scale and the quant of it. Um, it's very easy to kind of get caught up in just kind of the, the automation end of the future of work narrative and really lose sight of the human element. Um, we invest very heavily in our, in, in our philanthropic strategy in, you know, building training and education models that really prepare labor markets and prepare workers for kind of the next phase of work uh, in their communities. And it's very easy to do that without the worker voice present. Right. It's very, just based on the scale and the speed of the problem. And so what's, what I think struck us about this particular film, because we've actually used this as a team, um, what's, what struck us about it is that it, shows all the different nuances within this conversation. It's not just about kind of the monolithic idea of the American factory worker, right? It's about all of the different elements, all of the different human elements that are, that are kind of in this work that we have to be very mindful of, the conditions that people have to kind of traverse through to get ready for whatever's happening on the horizon. And so I think that this is a perfect example of how um, the power of storytelling, the putting a face on the issue brings to light a different way of thinking about it. Because every major company that's really grappling with reskilling and future of work issues, there's, there's an element of it. Like, what does this mean for diversity and inclusion? What does this mean for, um, you know, creating opportunities for individuals who have historically been kind of kept out of this, these industries. And this actually really paints a really crisp picture of that, of that piece. And Monique, if I could just add, we're talking about the future of work. One of the key, you know, from the worker point of view, one of the big beefs is we're not respected. It's not necessarily about money, although they'd like more money. Uh, it's more about, do I have a voice? Does anyone pay any attention? Are there, is there any teeth? If I make a complaint, you, you've seen the film, some of you, will it matter or will I get fired because I made the complaint? So one thing I feel strongly about, and I've come to feel this, is if you're gonna talk about the future of work, you have to have the worker voice at the table. It can't just be the companies or the government. It has to be the worker voice. And if you think about it, from what I've heard, see, see if you agree, the largest trainer of people to upskill people is the army. After that, it's unions. Let's not forget that as far as actually doing training to give people more of a path to the middle class. So I just wanted to make that point because sometimes unions are seen as opposed to people who own things. But I think this is a place where they could come together. Well, I'm going to challenge you on that because okay. after watching this documentary, I had the disheartening feeling that no matter how dignified and professional those American workers were, are, that, you know, you, you still face this problem where capital chases cheap. And, and the very problem these American workers face uh, beyond being more expensive is that they have expectations about limits on their work hours, uh, expectations about safety in the workplace, expectations about uh, environmental stewardship, right. things that the American labor movement helped to cultivate in them, but which very much seem to be on the downswing these days. Well, I was very proud I don't know what you think, of the American workers in the film who speak up about that, about EPA things, about safety things. But sometimes they get re there's retribution against them for speaking up. And this is not fair. Uh, so I don't know if you have Well, capitalism else. is like a shark that will always go, 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 and it needs, a, it needs a saddle, it needs a harness. Otherwise, we'd all still be working, you know, we'd have children working 12 hours a day in factories here. So, I mean, obviously, you need a balance. You, uh, the labor movement was a corrective to, you know, 80-hour weeks and deeply unsafe conditions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, there's a way to make it work. Right now in China, there's a nascent labor movement. Uh, it, you know, there, there are wildcat strikes happening. People are fed up with working 12 hours a day, six days a week, and or not getting paid. And they, they go on strike. We don't hear about it a lot, but if you go to, like, China Labor Bulletin, they track 
insurgent labor up, uh, uh, unrest there. But then you see factory owners moving the work to uh, countries where those labor movements are even, even weaker. Yeah. Even weaker. Yeah. Yeah, well, China's outsourcing factories to Vietnam now. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Uh, so something we came to realize, because the film takes you to China and we go into you know, the equivalent factories in China, um, the, the worker salaries are rising in China and they're stagnant here, at least in this part of this, this sector. I can't speak about all the sectors, tactile and everything else, but um, in, in auto, salaries are rising in China. Everything is very stagnant here and America is becoming a low wage country. And how do we feel about that? How do we feel about are we gonna have a middle class? Are we gonna have a blue collar middle class? I grew up as a working class person, um, but I was able to go to college. We had vacations. My dad knew he worked a 40 hour week and he wouldn't have to work more just because his supervisor said, no, you gotta come back tomorrow on Saturday. There wasn't that kind of thing. He was a union guy. Um, do we wanna have a middle class? Do we wanna be a low wage country, right? So that's where you might think about, you know, well, again, what kind of country do we want to live in? What kind of world do we want to live in? With the billionaire class way up here and the average worker way down here stagnating, that's what's happening. We all know it, right? You can read that in USA Today or whatever. Yeah. Monique? Yeah, I just wanted to chime in here. I think, you know, one of the kind of undercurrents that's in the movie is kind of this idea of kind of passion and purpose. Mm -hmm. And and I feel like, um, yes, we obviously see and have heard and read about, you know, this hollowing of the middle in the American labor market, right? That there is kind of a, a growth in high wage jobs and a growth in low wage jobs, but the it's, it's a relatively stagnation or much slower growth of, of, of middle income jobs. It's still growing, but it's slower. And so I think here's the opportunity for kind of creative capital to play a role because the the challenge that America faces, I, I mean, it, it's interesting how you hear like this conflicting narrative, right? Where you have, you know, 7 million jobs that have gone unfilled that are kind of middle, middle skill gap jobs and, you know, um, manufacturers, advanced manufacturers, industries across, uh, you know, across the country that are saying we, we have this skill demand that we can't fill. Simultaneously, you have workers who are saying we can't find jobs that, that will cover our cost of living. And so there's a gap here. And the reason why that gap exists is that we've got really antiquated infrastructure when it comes to education and training. We've got very antiquated policies, systems that are really tailored for an economy that really doesn't exist in major metropolises across the country. And so given the speed of automation, given the speed of our economy, we've got to figure out creative solutions to get that infrastructure to catch up, to evolve and really do more innovative work to prepare people in these spaces and for these roles. I mean, the reality is, is that that missing middle is actually not a missing middle. That middle is where man meets machine. And so how are we preparing workers? How are we preparing students? How are we preparing labor to meet machine in really creative ways? I mean, the reality is, is that America is still a creative economy. And so how are we preparing folks to adapt to what's, what's on the horizon? Harisela, what, what kind of uh, responses or answers along the lines of what Monique is talking about have you heard in these various screenings? Yeah, so it, it really, there are a range of responses. Um, what the film does beautifully is it asks a lot of questions, but it's not prescriptive in what the solution should be. And what we've tried to be adamant in bringing the film all across the country is we're not trying to vilify anyone. We're, we're recognizing that these are tough issues to grapple with, but how can we get creative about solutions? What we also recently found out, which a partner mentioned, is 2018 um, saw the, the greatest number of worker-led strikes since the 1980s. So there's this question bubbling up about what does power look like in, in different spaces, including in in, at work. Um, and what we are hearing partners 
grapple with as they watch the film is who am I when it comes to these issues and what is my role? So there are some people who you know, are thinking about labor from an organizing perspective. There's some people who are thinking about it from a training and workforce development perspective. The narrative that we want to try to paint is, given where you are now in your respective role, what does that incremental next step look like? Is, does it start with just having a conversation with your own workforce and acknowledging where you are or where you're not? Or do you have more resources that you can mobilize against trainings or technology? If so, how do you get to that next step? And how can we help forge connections to do that so that there's not these eco chambers of everyone's talking about the future of work, but they're talking about it in very separate spaces. So part of our role with storytelling and with trying to build these bridges is to connect all of the various opportunities that people are trying to explore and link resources to those who might need them, putting, putting workers back into that conversation too. So that, you know, we think about products from a user-generated design perspective, but we don't think about systems and practices from a worker perspective. So how can we get a little bit better at doing that? We were, yeah, go ahead. we were lucky to walk around that factory floor for three years, pretty much almost three years, and we got to know so many people who show up and punch a clock and go to their station and you know do their job all, all day long. And we were also very lucky that we had access to the management, to the, to the offices, the office suites, and to meetings, management meetings, where they talked about policy and they would made uh, changes to all kinds of things. And we were, frankly, Regular, regularly shocked and disappointed at how rarely management would get on the factory floor and go talk to the employees and listen and or go out for a beer or do something social with someone so that they could really hear the experience of this job and the challenges of this job from directly from a worker. And you know that's the kind of siloing that you're you're talking about, I think. And uh, it, it 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 it's not hard to do to walk out there and say, "How's it going? Can, what are you doing after work? Can we can I take you out for a burger?" Or even, you know, there was so often a huge gap between how management saw issues and saw solving them, and how the workers on the floor in great numbers would would say like, "No, that's not working. That does that policy has no teeth." Okay, there's a safety committee made up of workers, but who do they report to? They report to HR, and HR has no power, or very little power. Uh, sometimes on these various, there, there's a scene in our film where there's a, they have worker round tables. Workers are, you can tell there's unrest on the floor, so the company decides, let's have some worker round tables. And we filmed one and it's all American workers, and they, uh, they talk about all the American supervisors have been demoted. We only have Chinese supervisors now. Uh, and they, they order us around. They don't listen to us because it's a cultural difference in how work life is seen. They talk about folks pouring paint into the water supply. Uh, in the, so they, the worker roundtable, you know, like tries to raise things, and I was proud of that. But in the end, this one worker says, I don't want to waste your time. I don't want to waste my time. Will any of this matter, what we say here today? And that's what you kept hearing. There were like these kind of, I would have to say, kind of phony attempts to create structures that would hear the worker voice. But they had no teeth. They had no power. They just were swept right under the rug. They were kind of fig leaves. And, and the workers became very cynical about that then. Um, so I just wanted to, I think if there's any transformation, again, I say it in terms of the, the future of work or listening to workers, it has to include real voice of working people and their representatives. We see in Silicon Valley today, okay. middle class engineers who seem to be in a similar vein challenging their companies, saying, what is the social, political, economic impact of the products we're creating, of the contracts we're signing? Okay. And we also see that management responds to that with, well, your, your choice is either to not work on that project or to leave the company. Right, exactly. I also wanted to just say something. You know, we live in Dayton, Ohio, and we all know, you guys are mostly from the West Coast, I think. I don't know. But we all know that the, 
there's a struggle going on for the heart and soul of America. You know what I'm talking about. And I believe, and the 2020 elections are just one aspect of that, I believe that struggle is going to be fought out in the Midwest, in places like Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin. So we can't, we can't sit here on the West Coast and, and, and think like we'll, we'll deal with things in Silicon Valley, you know, which okay is important. But look, our community, like Dayton, Ohio, I'm just gonna give you one example. Because all the various companies left, GM left, NCR left, DHL left, everybody left, our school system is falling apart. 98% of the kids, and my grandkids go to the school system. We, they don't go to a private school outside of town. They go to the city schools. 98% of the kids are on, under the poverty level. All the schools are failing. The housing stock is falling apart. What hope is there in some ways if, you, if the best you can do is a 12 or 14 hour a, a, an hour job, you know, hard factory work or a, or a distribution center where you have a, one of those guns or a call center, $10 an hour, 12. What hope is there? Right? And that's why people turn to somebody who they think will give them hope, which, believe it or not, like, people, we knew that Donald Trump was going to win the election in Dayton, Ohio. We could see that. So I just have to say, it's like a, something we need to think about if we think about the future of our country. We have to think about the Midwest, because that is where the battleground is. Monique, not to pressure you or anything, but, but how do we give hope to that Midwestern uh, blue-collar worker? I mean, it's one of the things, for those who have seen the film, um, one of the things that I think is um, striking about the film is kind of the different types of narratives that show up, right? I mean, it's obviously you see the overwhelming narrative of kind of the, the typical kind of Midwestern factory worker. But then watching it again, um, you see other voices that are in there, right? And so one of the um, kind of paradigms in there is, yes, you have the older um, factory worker who's been in, in the industry for the last 30 years, but then when there's the issue around the union vote, you have an amplification of the younger factory worker who is like, okay, I'm here, I'm not gonna vote for this union because I can't afford to lose this job, right? I, I need this job. And it's, it's striking, it was striking to me because I think what that then says is, okay, why is this young person, why does this young person feel like they don't have any other options, right? Um, we're seeing um, kind of industry evolving in every major city across the country and the way cities are tackling it is is different right i mean you've got you've got the dayton ohio's but then you also have the pittsburgh's right which are finding new ways to kind of carve out um, a niche for industry and economy to provide more options and more opportunities. Obviously, education, training, that pipeline of preparation needs to go in tandem with that. And so it's disheartening to hear, right, that, that you, you see a, a public school system that's falling apart. That's a critical piece of this puzzle. And so the work that we've been doing has really been investing on the full scale, right? So yes, we have um, our heavy investment in kind of reskilling and, and preparing um, workers for kind of the evolving labor market, but we also actually have a considerable investment in career readiness as well, right? How are we looking at youth? How are we preparing systems to provide a broader set of opportunities and, and um, purpose for young people as they're trying to figure out where they're going to go? So it's, it's not an easy answer, right? Like how do you infuse and inject hope into these communities that feel very hopeless? Hopeless. But there are, I think, nodes, there are, there are bright spots across the country to draw from to see what are all the stakeholders that were involved in kind of turning this around, right? And this is what's great about the tour that, that Participant Media is doing. It's bringing all of those critical stakeholders to the conversation to say, okay, we all have to solve this. We all have a stake in this, and we have to think about this very differently in order to, to, to solve this. That gives the, the that plants 
plants the seed for the solutions that will kind of allow that hope to regenerate. And it's the movie that brings people together. Yeah. Exactly. It's, it's the idea of, the, of watching the movie together, not alone in your apartment or whatever, but together with other people and saying, okay, this raises a lot of questions. What are we going to do in our community? And each community is different e uh, on the tour. Each community is different. So we started off in Louisville. We're going to Indianapolis. Louisville, Kentucky. Kentucky, yeah, they have a big governor's race where labor issues are figuring quite prominently. Then we're going to Detroit and Pittsburgh. All are intended somehow to speak to the issue or highlight bright spots. And one thing that we've been hearing is there needs to be a realignment of priorities. So the shareholder based approach leads you down one particular road. Shareholder. Like feeling like you're accountable to shareholders oh, okay. and being driven primarily by profits instead of what the needs of the workers are. Companies, right? yeah. By companies, yeah. So if we start to think from a more holistic perspective, our partners point out the fact that, you know, the, the, uh, there are so many intersecting issues from education to healthcare to various other things that if you think about that, in the context of, well, how does this relate to work and the ability that wages or a certain lifestyle gives to an individual, to a family, to a community, there are costs and repercussions associated with that. So if we can bring different actors to the table for that more holistic conversation, then hopefully it can lead to a path of realigning what the way that companies are thinking about their practices as well. Now, I, I do want the audience to have an opportunity to ask oh, right. questions, but first I'm going to ask what is perhaps the scariest question of the morning, which is how do you see uh, things like uh, robotics and uh, artificial intelligence impacting this conversation going forward? Hey, look, robotics, it's great. You don't have to break your back doing your job, right? You don't have to have stress injuries on your arms. When we made, the, we made a film in the, about the General Motors plant that closed, and we talked to lots of workers, I don't believe there was a worker who'd been there, like say 10, 15, 20 years, who didn't have serious injuries because of that job. Even with the better ergonomics that, the, that they, over the years, brought in. Um, that's a real, uh, why, you know, we're like ground zero for the heroin epidemic. Dayton, Ohio, right? Well, I can understand it. People were in pain, and then they lost their job, and then they lost their hope. And you know, these things, these things happen. I'm not really answering your question, but we should view automation from a worker point of view as a good thing if there were other jobs, right? If people could be trained to operate the computers, or other, I'm sure you're the expert on this, though. I'm just telling you from my little point of view in this one factory. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's true. I mean, the reality is, is that this is not a new phenomenon yeah. for us, right? Like, I mean, it's technology that changed the, you know, agricultural sector, you know, significantly. And, and did it affect, obviously, agricultural jobs, farming jobs? Absolutely. Did it create other types of jobs? Absolutely. And so this is really just the next wave of that evolution. And so automation, robotics, all of that plays a really critical role. The reality is, is that just like there's not an office job that, that doesn't touch a computer, right? More occupations are going to be computer enabled, digitally enabled, technology enabled jobs. Um, and so we just have to prepare folks better for what those roles entail. Um, and I just wanted to just make one really quick um, comment about kind of the the middle income Silicon Valley engineer, right? Um, so the worker voice is broadening really significantly, um, and as as hard as it is to kind of see, given kind of the polarization of, of our labor market um, and kind of the income and wealth disparities that are existing in our economy, it, it is impacting how how American companies do business, right? Um, so one of the um, big recent kind of announcements was with the Business Roundtable, um, a number of major Fortune 500 companies who signed off on this pledge that it's not, it's not just gonna be shareholder earnings that's gonna drive practice, right? That's not gonna be where value is gonna be rested. Now what that means 
for each of these companies, we still have to see. But the reality is that people sign that pledge. Yeah, great. It's great to say that that was just altruistic and we just want to be great people. But the reality is, is that we've now got a tone and tenor in our labor market, particularly when we're thinking about the younger end of the spectrum. Well, people want to work for good people. People want to work for companies that are doing more, that are contributing more, that's not just about earnings and profits and shareholder returns, that they're actually making social impact in, in communities. And that includes with workers, that includes with the communities in which they sit and are invested in, and that includes shareholders. So it, it's changing, and it, and it was really the worker voice that brought that pledge into fruition. Yeah, the worker voice. And you know, people want to be proud of where they work. That is actually something that might surprise you. People on the floor, they might only have a high school education, but they would be proud that they made those GM trucks and cars. They would be proud of the advances they made in terms of ergonomics. They would be proud of the Worker Safety Committee. You know, they would be proud. They don't feel proud of the company, unfortunately, that they work for now. Um, you'd have to see the film to well, see some, why. Some people do, but okay. there's a lot of frustration that, yeah, that people, people are still dealing with. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting the uh, the high sign. Do we have room for one or two questions? Oh, yeah. Oh, 15 minutes. All right, awesome. All right, why don't we start with you in the pink? Yeah. There we go. Yeah, wait for the mic to come around so that uh, folks who are watching online can hear your question. Hi there. I'm Naja Lockwood, and um, I saw the film at Sundance. I was really oh. touched, and especially because uh, my in-laws are from uh, Dayton. My father-in-law ran NCR, and my aunt founded the uh, uh, the opera, uh, Dayton Opera. Oh, uh, wow. Lockwood. Thank you. Well, thank her. Um, my question is, um, what were some significant insights that you had that you didn't have when you started making the film? Uh, and you did have after finishing the film. And what are you both doing next? We did not know much about the trajectory of, of China before we started making the film. Or, you know, we had a, like a typical Midwestern myopic view. And really, we making this film opened us up to this sort of amazing achievement that's happened over the last 30, 30, 40 years since Deng Xiaoping opened up. And we, we realized uh, there's a lot of looking at that with a sense, from a, from a US point of view, there's, there can be an anxiety about looking at China's growth. But when we were hanging out with Wang or Leon or the other, these engineers who came over from China who are like, you know, they're 29, 33 years old, their parents lived in poverty, their parents lived in an agrarian life, and now they have a home, or they're, they're, you know, Wong is saving up enough money to build a home for his family. We, we looked, it really changed our perspective on looking at the miracle of what's happened in China, which is hundreds of millions of people are no longer in poverty. Now that has come at great environmental costs, great labor like issues, all kinds of problems, that's all true, we can talk about those, but it's also something to be looked at as an, a real human achievement in the history of the world, this, this transformation. So that, that was very eye-opening. But then in crafting the film, we really wanted to not watch it with a lens of Midwestern anxiety about I, that. And the real, uh, just a real quick answer to the other part of that. Um, we didn't know about the, the US-based basically consultancy industry, that is union avoidance industry. We didn't know about that. I don't think most people know about that, unless they're sort of in it. Uh, and the power of the union avoidance folks that they hired at over a million dollars, over a million dollars they spent on avoiding, like I would say, workers to have a fair election, because uh, I don't think it was a fair election. I mean, you saw the film, you can decide for yourself. Uh, that was kind of shocking to us because we're big believers in democracy, the democratic voice. And when you start firing people because they're pro-union or you start bombarding people with mandatory meetings again and again and again that give out like borderline illegal messages. Uh, and I, that was a big surprise uh, for, for us. But that's not just the Chinese, that's not just the oh, Chinese no. company, right? Not at all. Doing it. Yeah. No, 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 this is an American thing. You know, and in and fact, American it's not even a Europe. Regulators when we should be asleep at the wheel. I know when exactly when we showed this film in Europe, 
they were shocked. They don't have that kind of thing over there. In like we showed it in England and in France. And they, they don't have union avoidance, at least that's what people told us. And it's definitely not, the Chinese learned it from the American consultants, learned how to avoid the union. Oh, we're making another film about women workers, white collar. You know the movie Nine to Five, Jane Fonda? We're making a movie about the movement that gave rise to that movie. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, congratulations, first of all. Uh, the reviews have been tremendous over the last few months. Um, my name is Josh Kearns. I'm, with a, I'm a reformed journalist, uh, now consulting with Goal 17's a new startup out of Seattle, uh, m media uh, creation company as well as accelerator for impact startups is the goal of the founders. Um, I, I, I got into journalism 25 years ago to change the world, uh, but was always taught to sort of keep my hands off, tell the stories, and have become much more activist, and am overtly activist now. Question, I guess, you know, for the, from the participant media side, how do we leverage great content? What is your thinking? Now, obviously, activating local meetings are one thing, but at the end of the day, as you said, we need to change policy. I, I covered Boeing for 20 years. All of the fight, all of the issues you're describing are happening at Boeing right now. And as a result, there is no re-education funding. Uh, there, you know, in, in terms of th uh, those things that would actually provide other opportunities for future workers. Get to the middle class. And, and as a result, we have tremendous income inequality in Seattle. You need to earn over $150,000 to have a living wage now wow. and afford a home in the city of Se within city of Seattle. And it's not going to change anytime soon. How do we leverage great content in order to affect actual policy? Is it specific call voter registration drives at the meetings? Is it Going to Congress, there's a hearing today in Congress on work, worker issues, not a single worker's rights, I was just seeing on Twitter, not a single worker rights or w worker involved in any of the panels. Oh, that's terrible. Right. So if you think about what is it that storytelling can do that few other mediums can do, ultimately the way that we think about it as a participant is it can help create the cultural conditions for change. We're storytellers at Participant, we're not the issue experts. So we need to very humbly approach the, the perspectives that we're bringing to the table. It shouldn't be us saying what the solutions are, it should be how can we help individuals and organizations leading this change, the ones who have been fighting for these issues for decades who are gonna keep fighting after our release is done. And what we saw with a film like Roma last year is if you get people to talk about it, the right people, enough people, um, shining the spotlight that you have with the content on others in a deliberate way helps to empower movements that are already happening before we even make the film. So acknowledging that we're coming into spaces that are existing, the labor movement has been around and grappling with these issues for decades, but when you have the Obamas tweeting about a film, people are suddenly paying attention. So can we help bring the worker voice? Who is it that we're putting this film in the hands of? How do we get to scale? It's, on some films, it's easy to say, okay, there's a very clear call to action, and let's just give that to audiences and hope that we get to you know, a turning point. With something like, like this, it's much harder. This is a harder issue because it's very intersectional. It's, it's much more complex. So for us, the goal is how do we put the film and the materials that we can create around it in the hands of as many people who are having these conversations so it becomes an emotional entry point into the issue to bring new people in, to highlight the bright spot, spots, and to accelerate movements that are happening so that you know it's not just about us, we're just, can we add a little bit of fuel? And I think that's what storytelling can do beautifully. And we're going to Seattle, so we gotta get your card. Oh, we'd, oh love, yeah. we'd love to host a screening. Oh great, and everyone can sign up at the end. We'll have a sign up table if you, if yeah, you wanna host yeah, a screening. Yeah, Seattle, can't wait. My name's Oh, okay. my name is Greg Molnar with Goal 17. We have such alignment. We're storytellers for the new economy, and we're going to launch in about three months. Wow. First, Amazing. I want to say thank you. Uh, I ran a film, independent film company 20 years ago that won Sundance, and one of my responsibilities was financing our films. And if anyone talks about, anyone wants to talk about creative financing, talk about financing a film. So uh, two questions. One was, what was the budget for your film? 
Uh, it was uh, over a million dollars. It was under two million dollars, somewhere in there. Oh, way under. We're not million. supposed. To, we're not supposed, we're to, not supposed to, tell to give exact was. numbers, but that's okay. North of a million. That's north of a million, south, south of, of two, two million. million. Yeah, more. for yeah. people who haven't made a film, for you to make that film for under a million and a half dollars is extraordinary. What you're doing, a participant, is you're the good guys in Hollywood. Yeah, they're the good guys, <laughs> right? They you are. You know, which yeah. if you're involved, in, there aren't a lot of those guys. How do you guys keep funding? How do we keep yeah, how, funding content? Yeah. How, how it wasn't you, on our film that they earned money. No. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. I mean, how does participant stay financed? Because a lot of great studios have started and fallen apart. How do you guys stay financed so you can continue to support these kinds of films? Yeah, I, we at Participant have been very fortunate to work with some of the, the filmmakers and the content uh, creators that we've worked with. Um, you know, you have a film like Wonder a couple of years ago, which doesn't feel like it's, it's a big social change film, but it grows something like $300 million at the box office. It, it empowers us to be able to make other types of film too. Um, something like Roma, right? Not a natural investment, but we are looking at the potential of stories from a different lens. And when you have Netflix coming on board with Roma or with American Factory, who also believe and see that potential and they're willing to bring additional financing to the table, it's because there's a response from the audience for these types of stories. And that is bringing in more financing and it's helping craft better deals. As we craft deals too with distributors, we're trying to put impact into those deals. So there's an audience response and there's a shift within the industry towards what is the worth of these types of stories. And it's growing, which helps our business. And from our perspective, yes, we were first to the table when Jeff Skoll started this company with the belief that stories can change the world. Everyone thought that was a crazy idea. Now everyone's doing it. But we need to continue to innovate. How do we do that better? How do we bring others into the fold? And the fact that you're launching something that's in that vein, it's just, it's inspirational because there's power and the fact that we're in a growing ecosystem is, is meaningful. Well, one, if, if I may, one, one specific thing that happens is participant tries to sell their movies and at least recoup. Right. And so with American Factory, participant and we took the film to Sundance and sold it to Netflix and higher ground and made a little, you know, participant made a little bit of money, not a lot, but enough to recoup all what they had put in. Right. And that's true for Roma and that's true for a lot of their other films. That's right. Um, hi, thank you for speaking. I, I think taking it broadly, like some of you have asked some questions, we see represented on the stage here, obviously, production, filmmaking, and philanthropy. Um, and I'm curious if any of you have thoughts as this social impact entertainment space grows and we're seeing this sort of revolution, um, what some of the opportunities for, or like the, the opportunities you're seeing around um, growth and also possibly gaps in this space? Um, and sort of where you might suggest energy is most needed to continue accelerating the growth we're seeing. You mean in terms of philanthropy? In no. terms of philanthropy, in terms of production, we're hearing here other companies that are being started in this space, um, just taking it a step bigger uh, where you're seeing just sort of the industry move. Well, I think that's really oriented around like the, the production side, right? Yeah. Well, okay. I can I can start a little bit with that. I think the way that you know we're thinking about how does impact happen? Impact is long term. So the life cycle of a piece of content, if you think about the release, um, can be finite. Um, even though you know having the film on Netflix will make sure that it exists in perpetuity and the scale is very large. The way that we approach the work is, is it oftentimes it has a limited time frame, but how is it that we can empower communities and movements over a longer period? And sometimes that requires additional investment. It requires additional collaboration with organizations that intersects with different issues. So we're thinking about that. How is it that we can collaborate beyond just um, one piece of content or support communities more holistically, empowering them with content generally as a mechanism as a, and as inspiration for change? And I guess from the J.P. Morgan perspective, it, it might be helpful to hear about how content has been helpful in the conversations yeah. you're having. I mean, I think philanthropy shows up on, on kind of 
both ends of this potentially, right? Obviously, um, from where I sit, philanthropy, we're positioned to do something about it, right? We're, we're, we're positioned to, you know, tag on to, you know, these community conversations and figure out what's this, what's the solutions oriented investment. I think where there's probably less understanding is how, particularly when I think about arts and cultural philanthropy, how they leverage that, that grant making capacity as equity to invest into these type of ventures, right? Um, I think we know how to do that with, with like kind of traditional real estate, for instance, right? We know how to, and small business development, we know how to throw equity into that deal to kind of get you over the hump till you get into the black and move forward. We don't necessarily know how to do that in the kind of arts, culture, and film space. And so I think there's probably some um, kind of emerging knowledge development that needs to happen in that space to help arts and funder, uh, arts and cultural philanthropic organizations to think differently about how they invest in this space. I, I would just, you know, I'm not a philanthropist. I've never had that ability, let's say. Um, but I, I feel like if someone's thinking about investing in the future of work, let's say, which we, let's say, face it, if we want to have a middle class in America, people who can actually spend money uh, and, you know, keep the economy going, uh, you, you have to have workers at the table. You have to have community people at the table uh, in a real way, uh, make, making them feel respected and listened to and make sure they have a base that they're speaking from. I just feel like I also would always emphasize, I think the Midwest is highly neglected, at least in my view, um, economically, and uh, shouldn't be, because it's, again, it's that struggle for the heart and soul of America is going on there. I mean, we feel it around us every day. So those are two things, I, I don't know if that's helpful, but are important to me. Well, one of our partners is an organization called Jobs to Build America, and they right. they have done some really groundbreaking work. You know that work. group? They're, they're very much Los worth Angeles? a little research. They've done some Jobs really to move America. groundbreaking work on, on per, working with companies and corporations to create jobs that have living wages and are, are, are what we call good jobs. And, and lots of other things, like hiring workers who would normally not be seen as part of the labor force. Gender, you know, making sure that people of color and people who are women, you know, get hired, retraining. There's Jobs to Move America, you're shaking your head, is like a kind of a brilliant thing, yeah. and it's expanding, actually. Jobs to Move America, based in Los Angeles. And what's the name of the woman who's... Madeline Jansen? Madeline Jansen? Yeah. Janice. Janice? Janice, yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Two. Let's do two. Um, uh, let's yeah, see. Yeah, this yep. gentleman and then right behind you. Great. Uh, thank you, Julia and Stephen, for the movie. I've, I've seen it twice. Oh, that's <laughs> yeah. so good. It's an amazing movie. And uh, I'm, one of my big takeaways was really the stark contrasting culture approach to work between the Chinese and the American workers, that kind of collective approach versus the individualistic approach. And like that was one of my biggest takeaways and think the film does a great job with that. Um, my question is, do you think either in the making of the film or you know, the impact the film has had since then has changed Fu Yao at all or the chairman himself? He seems like a real introspective guy. Like, did he absorb any of this or process any of this? Did the company change? What do you guys think? Uh, the, the chairman has uh, supported the film. You know, we were nervous to show it to him, of course, because there's scenes that we knew he wouldn't like. But he's, oh, uh, Jacqueline? With the mic right yeah. up here. Yeah, um, with, the, with the black uh, yes, jacket. Yeah. Um, but he's been very supportive of it and wants to help get it out in, in China. Uh, the film... I don't know if... Yeah, we don't know if it's impacted the culture yet so far. We do know that it sparked a lot of conversations in the factory, but it's still kind of early days since the we, film released. Yeah, we, we talk to workers a lot, um, and... There doesn't seem to be a lot of change. I will tell you one thing that will be funny to people who have seen the film. We heard that people went around after the film came out on Netflix with duct tape over their mouth. As a sort of a protest, because there's a scene in the film well, where... Wait, don't tell, don't tell. Okay, the sorry, no, no spoilers. Seven o'clock tonight. You have to watch the movie. Or Netflix. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Hi, my name is Tracy, and I want to kind of piggyback on something that Monique said as far as where energy 
could still be placed in learning and teaching. And I want to expand that particularly with social impact stories and that may have a long-term um, impact where you can't see it in the short term. And I want to, my question is, particularly on the philanthropic and investment opportunities, recognizing that these stories will change perception and that perception can influence where money flows and where it doesn't flow. So is there a, an openness in the investment community and in the philanthropic community for that long-term objective where you're seeking to change perception, recognizing that that's prerequisite to creating the type of major and sustainable change on the economic level as well, domestically and internationally. Yeah, so I think it is a gradual sea change that's happening in philanthropy. Um, it is, um, it is a, definitely a culture shift, and we see some foundations that are moving on that um, kind of more center mass than others, right? Um, and it, and it, a lot of, in a lot of ways, it's also regionalized, right? Like, so you have perfect example, like here in the San Francisco area, the San Francisco Foundation is looking at the, the, the social impact and worker voice very differently and very progressively in a way that you don't see necessarily across the country. Um, so, but it, it's, it's a slow and gradual sea change because oftentimes philanthropy um, in a lot of ways, um, the way we think about our grant making is how do we reach scale faster um, and how do we um, kind of follow the longevity of these investments over time. Um, we know grants kind of they're in cycles, right? And so how do you continue that progression over longer stints of time? And you definitely see that where there's kind of really deep strategic market investment. You see a lot of that in Detroit right now. You see a lot of that in Chicago and other, other major cities that really have long-term philanthropic investment. And that kind of gives more um, space for the narrative, more investment in the narrative shift to occur. Um, but there's, I think, still a ton of work that has to be done. I mean, I think about, for instance, Ford Foundation is, is an example where they have an approach to the future of work, but their approach is really, in fact, they, they name it that it's the future of workers. Like their investment is in the future of workers and that the, the, the narrative becomes a really critical piece of that effort both to kind of just highlight the experience of, of the worker, but then also to get the worker voice to have some cohesion because there are so many different kind of disparate angles to this issue. And so it's hard to make it sound more like a symphony, right? To actually understand what is the perspective coming from that side of, of this discourse. And so it, it's very early days. I think it'll probably um, kind of accelerate and amplify as the economy continues to move at the pace that it's moving, but we still have a lot of work to do in that space. And you know, the future of workers is also, the I see it from Dayton, Ohio, is the future of communities. You know, yeah, like where did our tax base go? People have $12 an hour jobs. They, they don't have, their taxes are not supporting the schools, are not supporting the re renovation of communities. So it's, it's not just about the individual person getting a better deal. It's also about what they then, their ta through their taxes and their ability to give back, what they give to our communities and what that means to, again, America. You know, a lot of the Midwest, we're suffering, not everywhere. But um, anyway, I won't go on anymore about the Midwest. Well, that's a great point to end on. I, I want you to join me in thanking our panelists today. <laughs>